Hello everybody, it's Andrea. I am back with a book haul and it's a large book haul. I do apologise if I look like a Disney villain. I have been playing with makeup. I'm not very good at playing with makeup but you know, I don't know. Yeah, I look a bit like a Disney villain but it's okay. <laughs> um, so yes, I'm here to do a huge book haul. This is uh, all the books I got in January and February. Now to be fair, I only got one in February. But I got a lot in January because I got uh, three brand new books that I bought for the permanent collection. I got six from a charity shop, or seven from a charity shop, four from my mum, and a great big stack from my friend Julie. Let's start with the new books I bought. So the first one I bought is from my challenge, Agatha Christie, and then there were none. Basically this tells the story of ten people who are invited to an island off the coast of Dorset, I think, or Devon, uh, where somebody begins murdering them one by one. Will anybody survive it? And who's the killer? Uh, the second one, again, is another Agatha Christie for the challenge. And that's sparkling cyanide. Cyanide, I can't even say it. Cyanide. Six people sit down to a sumptuous meal at a table laid for seven. In front of the empty place is a sprig of rosemary, rosemary for remembrance. A strange sentiment considering no one is likely to forget that night, exactly a year ago, that Rosemary Barton died at the very same table, her beautiful face, unrecognisable, convulsed with pain and horror. But then Rosemary had always been memorable. She had the ability to arouse strong passions in most people she met, in one case strong enough to kill. And then while I was doing some of the... You know list challenges? You get, you see them on Facebook and um, they do book lists. I found a series of uh, books based in Egypt about this woman who goes there. Um, uh, the first book in the series I picked up is Crocodile on the Sandback by Elizabeth Peters. No crocodiles really in it though. And basically, emancipated and forthright, Amelia Peabody, an indomitable product of the Victorian era, embarks on her first Egyptian adventure armed with unshakable self-confidence, a journal to record her thoughts, and a sturdy parasol. On her way there, Amelia rescues young Evelyn Barton Forbes, who has been ruined and abandoned on the streets of Rome by her callous lover. She takes her to Cairo as her companion. From there, the two women sail up the Nile into their biggest ever adventure, arriving at an archaeological site run by the Emerson brothers, the dashing Emerson and amiable water. Amelia discovers their little party is increased by one, an ancient Egyptian mummy that pro proves to be an alarming and decidedly lively sample of the species. Anything with mummies in Egypt in it is good for me. And then the final book I bought brand new this month is Frank and Marilyn by Edward Z. Epstein. The Lives of Loves, the Fascination Relationship of Frank Sinatra and Marilyn Rona. I know the Marilyn community has not got this good reviews. There's a lot of errors in it from the Marilyn perspective. Of course, we're not Sinatra experts, so we don't know about the Sinatra aspect of it. Oh, I've never read a biography of him. It's one thing I must do. <coughs> but I know he relies on some people that have been debunked, so it's hard. Frank Sinatra and Marilyn Monroe never before teamed in a book, yet theirs was a seven year friendship, an on and off intimate relationship, shrouded in secrecy and fraught with danger. We all know where that's going. Frank Sinatra and Marilyn Monroe, here's the first book to bring these two all American icons together. Their friendship and on and off intimate relationship kept secret because of powerful others in their lives spanned several, seven tumultuous years. At one point, he even proposed a marriage. In Frank and Marilyn, we follow Sinatra and Monroe from one explosive relationship to another. Their marriages and love affairs eventually lead into a tangled relationship with each other, sparking a nasty rivalry between Frank and Marilyn's ex-husband and one-time friend of Frank, Joe DiMaggio. Frank and Marilyn's ultimate disastrous relationship with John F. Kennedy, <coughs> his, his brother Robert and their often ruthless family was a fatal move for Marilyn. Her death remains a controversial topic to this day. Only if you believe the rumours and the um, conspiracy theories, which most Marilyn fans don't because it's all been debunked, but that's a story for TikTok or something like that. Now, the books I got from my mum, which I probably got from the charity shop, we got Nora Roberts' Summer Pleasures. Jennifer stuck a sticker on the back, or somebody has. Lee Radcliffe, a reporter for Celebrity Magazine, is desperate for an exclusive and notoriously reclusive writer, Hunter Brown. Hunter agrees to the interview on the condition that she comes camping with him. Alone with a seductively mysterious author, Lee discovers that it's Hunter she really wants exclusively. 
and then oh because there's two stories in here the first one is called second something and the second one's called one summer so there's two Second Nature and One Summer. Uh, Travelling across America with brooding photojournalist Shade Colby was not celebrity magazine photographer Brian Mitchell's idea of a dream assignment. They disagree about everything from photography to careers to lifestyles. Okay. Everything except their fierce attraction to each other. So a couple of romances there. Then we've got this one. It's called Lazy Eye. Yes, Jennifer's definitely been sticking her stickers on this one. Paw Patrol. By Donna Daly Clark. In 1985, Jeff Hurst is doing okay considering. At 19, he has a key to his own front door and a standing order at Mrs Wong's restaurant. Then a journalist offers to pay Jeff Hurst for his version of the events that put his father behind bars nine years earlier. 1976 is the hottest summer on record. Life is sunny side up. Jeff Hurst is the leader of his gang, the Four Aces. His mother is almost a birthday queen and Jeff Hurst, uh, his father's a fo footballer and Jeff Hurst knows that he too will grow up to be something. The sun is shining and it looks like it will never stop, but then it does. That'd be quite interesting. Ah, uh, Louisa Ellicott by Anne Victoria Roberts. This is a classic romance, gloriously reborn and junky to boot. In the ghostly shadows that lay between the gas lamps of the city of York, the past was ever present. Binding, sorry, there's a sticker on top of it. Uh, cousins Louisa and Edward Elliot with the stigma of their illegitimacy until out of the mist emerged Robert Duncannon, an Irish officer with the Royal Dragoons. Dashing and impetuous, he's everything worthy, steadfast Edward can never be. Obsessed by an overwhelming love, Louisa says to Dublin to be with Robert, but in Ireland she encounters hostility and the mysterious Charlotte, who then threatens to shatter Louisa's dreams, Louisa's dreams forever. At once an irresistible blend of period detail and passionate love. Louisa Elliot is a classic romance, glorious reborn as a magnificent novel from the pen of major new talent and Victoria Roberts. It's gonna be a while before I get to that chunky one. And then we've got a Patricia Cornwall one. I'm surprised my mum reads this. She's not really into this stuff normally. Uh, the Last Precinct. I don't think I've read this one. It's got a sticker on the back as well. Funny that. We enter the last precinct through the reverberating aftershocks of Black Notice. Inconceivably finding... <coughs> oh, excuse me. Virginia's chief medical examiner, Kay Scarbetta. Scarbetta. I can't say it. As an object of suspicion and criminal investigation. And the nightmare perpetuated on Scalpetta's doorstep continues as she discovers that the so-called werewolf murders may have extended to New York City and into the darkest corners of her past. When a formidable prosecutor, a female assistant district attorney from New York, is brought into the case, Scarpetta must struggle to make what she knows to be the truth prevail against mountain and unnerving evidence to the contrary. Tested in every way, she turns in to ask... Where do you go when there's no one left? The answer is the last precinct. So, yeah, there's that one. You'll have to excuse me. I am a bit breathless, a bit wheezy today. You may, won't be a sec. Right, on to the ones I bought from the charity shop. This was right at the beginning of the month before I got this huge haul of books from my friend Julie. She's my friend. I'm not saying because she's not, because I love it a bit. So I got a book called Raising the Roof by Jane Wenham Jones. Um, Carrie is jobless and has an overdraft the size of the national debt. She'll be homeless too if she can't come up with some cash to buy out Martin, her ex-husband. He who cut up her Barclay card before he moved in with another woman. No wonder she's desperate enough to fall for dodgy entrepreneur Nigel's get rich quick scheme, buying the worst house in town to convert into flats. All she has to do, he tells her, is to get a bank loan and the money will roll in, but it doesn't work out quite like that. Carrie is lumbered with a bank manager on the warpath, a sister on the verge of a nervous breakdown, a friend who's permanently pregnant, a friend who may be pregnant but not by the right man, and a tenant who won't pay the rent. It's not long before there are bailiffs at the front door and Carrie finds herself in the back of a police van and Nigel has mysteriously disappeared. There is a knight in shining armour on the horizon, but naturally he's married to someone else. <sighs> Sounds all right to me. Nice little fun one there. And then I've got A Hollywood Ending by Robin Sisman. Nice pink book. Spoilers Hollywood star Paige Carson flees to London when her career and personal life hit disaster. By accepting a stage role in a Shakespeare play, she intends to prove that she is a real actress 
and to find herself a real man between rehearsals. But can she survive without her entourage? How will she even get places without her driver? Who's going to like pay for stuff? And what's with English men, especially her disdainful neighbour Ed? Either this is the biggest mistake of her life or Paige is going to have to learn fast to stand on her own two immaculately pedicured feet. Sounds like fun. Then I've got Goodbye Perfect by Sarah Bernard. This one. Ada McKinley knows she can't count on much in this world, but she can depend on Bonnie, her solid, loyal, straight A best friend. So it's a complete shock when five days before the start of their GCSEs, Bonnie runs away with a guy Eden knows nothing about, and it's the last person she ever would have expected. As the days pass and her world begins to unravel, Eden is forced to question everything she thought she knew about her best friend and herself. Sounds fun. I've got this uh, rather... I love the cover on this, The World Between Us, uh, by Lydia Sisson. I love the cover. With Europe on the verge of war, Felix is on the verge of discovering love, but discovery means choice. And she has to decide between logic and attraction, good sense and passion. As suburban London becomes a memory, Felix has to battle to survive, not just the battles of the Spanish Civil War, but also the conflicts of her own heart. A passionate and exciting adventure story that explores the meaning of love and the power of choice. Okay, and we've got these, these like 25 pence each in the charity shop, so I'm, I just, and yeah, you're not gonna. Lipstick Jungle by Candice Bushnell. She's the lady that wrote Sex in the City. One Fifth Avenue is the building, the chicest, the most stylish address in New York. With its, within its sumptuously thick walls, the luxurious lives of Manhattan's elite play out. No one else can capture New York. The city where your zip code is as important as your designer handbag, with the brilliant wit and flair of Candice Bushel. So that sounds quite fun. Now, the last two ones have been big on booktube and booktok, so that's why I picked them up. And the first one is The Tattoo of Auschwitz, or Auschwitz by Heather Morris. So in 1942, Leil Sokolov arrived in Auschwitz-Birkenau. He was given the job of tattooing the prisoners marked for survival, scratching numbers into his fellow victims' arms in indelible ink to create what would become one of the most potent symbols of the Holocaust. Waiting in line to be tattooed, a terrified and shaken was a young girl. For Lael, a dandy jack in the lad, a bit of a chancer, it was love at first sight, and he was determined not only to survive himself, but to ensure this woman, Ijita, did too. And so begins one of the most life-affirming, courageous, unforgettable and human stories of the Holocaust. The love story of the tattooist of Auschwitz. Do you know what? That actually sounds really good. Yeah. And then I also got All the Light We Cannot See by Anthony Doer, which is also one that's big on there. That's quite a chunky book, isn't it? Or somebody's dog eared a page, but as a second hand, I don't care. <coughs> I feel very chesty today. Open your eyes and see what you can with them before they close forever. For Marie Law, by and since the age of six, the world is full of mazes. The miniature of a Paris neighbourhood, made by her father to teach her the way home. The microscopic layers within the invaluable diamond her father guards in the Museum of Natural History. The walled city by the sea where her father and daughter take refuge when the Nazis invade Paris. And a future which draws her ever closer to Werner, Werner a German orphan destined to labour in the mines until a broken radio fills his life with possibility and brings him to the notice of the Hitler Youth. A magnificent, deeply moving novel, the stories of Murray Law and Werner illuminate the ways against all odds that people try to be good to one another. I can see where it's fair. Oh, Pulitzer Prize for Fiction 2015. Nice. So, right, on to the ones that my friend Julie gave me. Most of them are by one author, so we're going to do the two that aren't by that one author at the moment. And um, again, they're two uh, popular ones, especially the first one, which is The Hate You Give by Angie Thomas. Didn't know anything about this, really, other than it's been very popular, and uh, I read the back and I thought, ooh. So what's the point in having a voice if you're going to be silent? Star lives in two worlds, the poor neighbourhood where she was born and raised and her posh high school in the suburbs. The uneasy balance between them is shattered when Star is the only witness to the fatal shooting of her unarmed best friend, Khalil, by a police officer. Now what Star says could destroy her community, but it could also get her killed. 
<laughs> that sounds moving. It's, that sounds quite terrifying and moving, to be honest. And then Patrick Ness release. Now I've only read A Monster Calls by Patrick Ness, so I'm looking forward to seeing what this one is. Sometimes the end of the world is the start of your life. Ooh. It's sassy. It's a summer, and although he doesn't know it yet, everything in Adam Thorne's life is going to fall apart. Relationships will change, he'll change, but maybe, just maybe, he'll find freedom in the release. Time is running out, though, because way across town, a ghost has ridden from a lake, searching and yearning, she leaves a trail of disgust, destruction in her wake. Ooh. Oh, yes. Now, the books that Julie gave me, there are editions missing. So there are series, there's three different series here. But there are books missing so I will show you which ones I've got now with one series I know I'm going to get the next book uh, the book that's books that are missing because I enjoyed the first one so that's fine the other two I haven't read any of them so we'll start with this one so Diane Shan um, this is Lord Loss which is part of the Demonata series I think there's one or two missing from this I like the covers Jennifer doesn't the door feels red hot, as though a fire is burning behind it. I press an ear to the wood, but there is no crackle. No smoke, just deep, heavy breathing and a curious dripping sound. My hands on the doorknob. Inside the room, somebody giggles. Low, throaty, sadistic. There's a ripping sound, followed by snaps and crunches. My hand turns, the door opened. Hell is revealed. When Grubbs Grady first encounters Lord Loss and his evil minions, he learns three things. The world is vicious. Magic is possible. Demons are real. He thinks he will never again witness such a terrible night of death and darkness. He is wrong. Okay. Yeah, that sounds... I've just got to check the time. Hold on a sec. Oh, I haven't got long. I've got to get Jen in a minute, so... I'll come back and finish this when we get back. Okay, back from picking up Jennifer. She's downstairs. Right, so then we've got... Darren Chan, book two of the Demonata, The Demon Thief. A huge jagged past, patch of light grass forms at the foot of my bed and a shape presses through. I'm too horrified to scream. It's a monster from my very worst nightmare. Pale red skin, dark red eyes, no nose, sharp grey teeth. Ooh, sounds scary, doesn't it? So I'm not going to read all the descriptions for all the, the Darren Chan ones. There's just too many of them. We'll be here forever. But we've also got book five, so I'm missing three and four. I've got the rest of them, but I'm missing three and four, which is um, Blood Beast. Then we've got Demon Apocalypse, Death Shadow, and then Wolf Island. Dark Calling and Hell's Heroes. So that's the D Demon Art series. Now obviously I'm missing books three and four so if I need to, if I enjoy books one and two I will get uh, three and four. And then the next one is the Vampire series. Um, the Saga of Darren Shan it's called. First one's the Vampire Blood Trilogy, Vampire Rights, Vampire Destiny but I am missing I can't Hang on, what's the numbers there? Uh, three, six, nine, twelve. I got. I can't think. Um, so I've got the first three, and I'll just. No one expects expects to pay for the mistakes in blood, but for Darren Chan, life as an ordinary school ball is over. In Cirque to Freak, Darren strikes a deal with a creature of the night that will change his life forever. In The Vampire's Assistant, Darren joins the vampire ranks but fights the urge to drink human blood. And in Tales of Blood, Darren will need all the luck of the vampires to defeat a savage um, enemy. So that's the first three volumes. And that's that trilogy. And then, that's the last ones. Um, four, five and six is called Vampire Rights Trilogy. So in Vampire Mountain, Darren Shan and Mr. Creepsley embark on a dangerous trek to the very heart of the vampire world. In Trials of Death, Darren has to, prance, has to pass five deadly trials to prove himself to the vampire clan and in the vampire prince. Can Darren outwit a cunning foe or is this the end of thousands of years of vampire rule? Uh, so I'm missing 7, 8, 9, but in 10, 11 and 12 it's called Vampire Destiny. 
And in Lake of Souls, Darren and Harkett go on a quest to the Lake of the Dead through a world of mystery and terror. In Lord of the Shadows, Darren returns home and confronts demons of his human past. In Sons of Destiny, Darren faces arch enemy Steve Leopard for a fight to the death. With time running out, can Destiny, or Des Tiny, as it says, be foiled? Or is the world doomed? So, and that's the last one. So if I enjoy the first six, I'm obviously going to get seven, eight, and nine, and then enjoy ten and twelve. Again, I'm missing one or two from the next series, which is the zombie series. Um, so this is the cover of the first one. Can you love a bullying racist thug if he's your father? How do you react when confronted with your darkest inner demons? What do you do when zombies attack? B. Smith is about to find out. So that's that one. And the second one is called Zombie Underground. Can you hold under your humanity if you're a monster? How do you face the present if you're haunted by the past? Where can you turn when you're trapped in a living nightmare? For B. Smith, death is not the end. Now, I'm not sure which one I'm missing, so I'm just going to check. Now, I will be buying this, the one I'm missing out of this. Um, just simply because I know I enjoyed the first, I have read the first one and it will be in my wrap-up when I finally fil film it. Um, I'm just checking in this last one. Uh, which one I am missing. Uh, there's a list in one of the books. Oh, here we go. Nope, not in this one by the look of it. Oh, I don't know anyway. Anyway, then I've got Zombie City. How many survived the zombie apocalypse? Where do the living hide in a city of the dead? Who controls the streets of London? B. Smith is setting out to explore. Ah, yes, so I think I haven't got the next one, which the next one is called uh, Angels. So I haven't got Zombie Angels. I have got Zombie Gladiator. Um, and this one, how can you prove yourself in a world of lost souls? Who will triumph in a battle of the damned? Where do the dead come to fight? B. Smith is about to enter the arena. Then I've also got Zombie Mission. This one is uh, paperback, sadly, the rest of my hardback. Um, what has happened to the world since the, the dead took over? Where have all the humans gone to hide? Who do the living have most to fear? B. Smith is heading for unknown territory. And the last one I have is zombie clans. I think, yes, uh, there's a list in here. Yeah, so I'm missing, I have zombie family. Can I put that down somewhere? Zombie. I'm sure I did. Yeah, zombie family here. Right, that's the last one. So yeah, in this book it has got this. I miss missing four and five zombie angels and zombie baby. So I'll have to get those. Um, so I'm just reading the back. So there is a bit more on the inside, but I don't want to spoil the plot. How much do you value your best friend's life? Where do you go when you run out of options? How far can you trust an evil promise? B. Smith must consider the next move. And I, I'm deliberately changing certain things so I don't give away part of the plot of the first book. And Zombie Family. Can anyone hurt you as much as a loved one? When does the fight become too much to bear? How much panic can one person endure? Pain, sorry, can one person endure? B. Smith is discovering the true meaning of family. Oh, yes. So, those are all the books I got in January and February. I know it's a lot. It's a ridiculous amount of books. Thank you, Julie, if you ever watch this, um, for giving me all these books, even though they're missing a few, and I'm quite happy to buy the ones I haven't got. I really am, because I don't mind that at all. And she's given me books in the past. She's always passing stuff on to me. She's a fabulous friend. Um, I'm so excited to be reading pretty much any of these books, particularly the Darren Chan ones, because they, they are good reads. I haven't read the first zombie one. Um, and I'll probably read the whole zombie series before I move on to any others and then I might hit the vampire ones because who doesn't love a good vampire story? It's not Twilight anyway. So that's all the books I got in January and February. I'll see you soon. I will be filming a wrap up of January and February's reads. I haven't been reading so much due to the building work we've had on. I just haven't been able to concentrate which is why there was no wrap up last month. So I'm just going to do a whole big wrap up in one go. Uh, in a few days time when I get a chance to film again which might be Monday 
it really depends. Take care everybody and I'll see you soon. Happy reading.